So you chanted to undertake the eight precepts today. As eight precepts, we can talk about sila, or virtue, making virtue firmly established, making it a firm foundation in the heart. And this virtue is an important dhamma. It leads to peace and collectedness in samadhi, leads to wisdom. This is all because of virtue that's firmly established. So virtue means having restraint in our actions of body, actions of speech, and our mind as well. Having care with regard to the mind, having care with regard to action of body and speech. In doing this, this leads to peace and samadhi to arise. This is a benefit of virtue. We say, silena sugating yanti, silena boga sampada. So sila, virtue, leads to happiness, leads to wealth. You can say noble wealth. This is the best kind of wealth. Because if one has a lot of wealth, but they don't have virtue, then that wealth can be lost. Or if one gets wealth but lacks virtue, then that won't be stable. And one like that doing merit will only get a little bit of fruit from their giving and merit that they do. But one with virtue, even if they only have a little wealth, they make merit, they practice giving, they feel great joy in the heart, great happiness, great fullness in the heart before giving, while giving, and then after giving, they can recollect that giving and feel that fullness in heart again. So one with virtue, one doesn't need to spend money. One establishes one's heart, sets one's heart to do the eight precepts, whether it's a lunar observance day or another day. We may, or on the other days we do the five precepts. And it's something that we can chant and undertake alone we can do it uh, on our own or by ourselves. And it gets to the point where that virtue is automatic in ourselves. We don't need to have the intention to bring it about, but it's already there. So this is the virtue of one who's entered the stream of Dhamma. This is a holy one of the highest type. This is one for whom the enemies in the heart are far away. This is a noble being. And these enemies of the heart are greed, aversion, and delusion. So a noble one, they're far from these enemies. Because these enemies in the heart of greed, aversion, and delusion, they cover over the mind. So we train our mind to be able to be free of them. So we train our minds, we set our hearts to have virtue, to care for the mind. And this word mind or jitta, you can also say mano, mano meaning the mind. So the mind is still and we don't feel any sense impressions at all. This is the mind in the middle. But then when sense impressions arise, then the mind has uh, clinging with regard to them, and then kilesa arises. So whether it's a sound, or sight, or taste, or touch, or smell, or mind object, when that sense impression makes contact, then the kilesas arise. And these kilesas arise because of vipaka, or actions that we've done in the past, the results of kama. So things that we liked in the past, we like them again. Things that we've disliked in the past, we dislike them again. So this is a mind that's not well controlled. And then this uncontrolled mind flows out to actions of body and speech, following after the moods of the mind. This is called a lack of virtue, which results in chaos and agitation. So like this, one thinks something and then speaks it straight away, or thinks something and acts on it straight away. And this is a dangerous situation. 
This is lacking mindfulness, lacking restraint, not having mindfulness, not having wisdom. And this lack of control over the mind, then the kilesas go to actions of body, speech, and mind, and this results in agitation and trouble. And when this trouble and chaos arises, because of the defilements, the kilesas, so in society we see that one with virtue has loving kindness, gives forgiveness. They don't look down on others, but they spread loving kindness, spread loving kindness in front and behind, to the left and right, up and down, in all directions, not having ill will, not having wishes of harm for any being. So this is loving kindness. So this loving kindness, we practice it a lot until the point where it's apamana, or without limit, boundless loving kindness. And in this way, wisdom can arise. This is called metta jeto vimut, metta jeto vimuti. It's a mind that is free through the practice of loving kindness, or a mind liberated through the practice of loving kindness. So one becomes an Arya Pugala, a noble one, through the practice of loving kindness, or metta. So loving kindness is a Dhamma that supports the world, that cares for the world. So we see the world in the past to the present day, in the Buddha's time. Whenever there's a lack of metta, that's where agitation and trouble arises. And there's a sense of self, ill will, hurting and harming. It's a lack of metta. So practitioners with the five precepts, with the eight precepts, that's a mind with loving kindness. A mind of metta without ill will, not wishing harm on any being. We can do that for one day or night, seven days, seven nights, or a whole month. This is something truly amazing. So we set our hearts on it. For myself, as a lay practitioner, I would undertake the eight precepts and otherwise have the five precepts. There was one occasion I was listening to the Dhamma from Venerable Ajahn Louis, who was a disciple of Venerable Ajahn Man. I was listening in to his discourse in the forest Maybe it was about the year uh, 2518, or about uh, 48 or 47 years ago. And that was around Asalaha Puja. And Venerable Ajahn Louis was speaking about the practice and about how the devas, the heavenly beings, come to rejoice and come to listen to the Dhamma. And ever since that day, I had undertook the eight precepts up until the day of my ordination. So one sees that the eight precepts has great benefit. And the eight precepts, they arose from the practice of the five precepts and then keeping the eight precepts until my ordination at Wat Nong Papong. So you see that this gives strength and energy to the mind. It's and gives the practice of the precepts uh, a firm continuity to be firmly established. For instance, not eating beyond noon, then we have time to practice. We have more free time. And if we're not able to do that, then we can eat up until 1 p.m. So this is reckoned as an eight precepts that's not strict but it's upholding the meaning of having just two meals. So we are able to do that. And when we do the eight precepts, our body can feel light and at ease because we just eat in the morning time period so our body can feel healthier. And we have more time as well. And we observe that all the proliferation around food in the evening Around the evening meal, there can be a lot of thinking and proliferating. And also having eaten the evening meal, it may not fully digest, and then we sleep while it's digesting, then we easily gain weight from that. 
So during the eight precepts, we have time, we have the opportunity to chant and meditate more. The body's not digesting food, not burning food. Also, if we eat a lot, then we can feel sleepy because the blood sugar is high. And so when we do the eight precepts, the body can adjust to it and the cultivation of samadhi or collectedness becomes easier. We have the more opportunity, more time to sit meditation, to chant. The mind's not agitated or wavering with regard to food, which can end up wasting a lot of time. We don't uh, decorate our bodies and we don't spend time getting lost in all the, th the things, for instance, on smartphones, not watching entertainment, which can end up wasting a great deal of time, not looking at the news, but just stopping that for that period, not watching movies or listening to music or videos, but we just put that to the side and we have more time. On the five precepts, we can watch movies or listen to music and so on. And it starts out as one hour and goes to two hours. And it can end up wasting a lot of time. Then we have less time to train the mind in peace and samadhi. So undertaking the eight precepts, this is a practice. <coughs> This is practicing as homage to the fully self-awakened Buddha. So we set our hearts to be heedful, not to be heedless. Just as the Buddha said as his last statement before he passed into Parinibbana, all bhikkhus, may you be consummate in heedfulness. So we set our hearts to practice, cultivate the mind, to be heedful. Just like the great teachers have said, that one who has mindfulness is one who is not heedless. But one without mindfulness is heedless. So we see, we've seen uh, dead bodies without breath. So we've seen death like that. But we've also seen dead people that still are breathing. These are minds that are heedless. And there are a great many uh, beings like that. So have you seen anyone like that? So the great teachers would ask like this. So therefore we see the importance of heedfulness. And that the five precepts, the eight precepts, bring a great deal of benefit. They lead the mind to enter the stream to Nibbana. And one who's entered the stream to, Nib to Nibbana has the five precepts well established as a normal state of mind. And has the intention in the mind to not kill. We can give an example. If someone brought an animal, like a pig or a cow or a chicken and so on, and that person told us, well, we have to kill that animal or else they will kill us. So one who has the five precepts or the eight precepts, they would accept death. They wouldn't accept to kill another being because they would see that that comma of killing would give result in the future and give result for a long time. Because if we die, it's just our bodies that die and we have to die anyway. So we wouldn't accept to kill. And even if that person didn't kill us, then we would die anyway. So dying without having made bad karma is better. It's better to do merit. And this is bringing virtue to the level of paramata parami, or supreme or high, uh, supreme parami, supreme spiritual virtue in the mind. And we don't have to undertake it formally, but we can undertake it in the heart. We do that as a practice, a homage to the Buddha. And the benefit of virtue is a mind that's not agitated, both the body and mind, untroubled, unagitated. And we can cultivate samadhi. 
And once we cultivate samadhi, then we can contemplate the body as a heap of natural elements, as a heap of the unbeautiful. We can look at our body and we can take a skeleton as our friend, as if we're walking together as friends, friends in old age, sickness and death. We go together like that. So we can take that skeleton as our friend and can walk together like that. Because that skeleton used to walk just like us. And then when we die, then our body, our skeleton can be put in a cupboard just like that, the skeleton that's already there. So just like we're walking now, and then we can end up in that cupboard, it's just like that skeleton. So we see that we're, we're friends like that, that all of us have to age, have to sicken, have to die. And therefore we don't harm any being, but we have loving kindness, we have virtue. This gives rise to coolness in the heart and mind. We see that sila, virtue, gives rise to coolness in the heart, gives rise to happiness, and leads to nibbana. And it leads one to Arya Pugala, or one is able to realize the state of being a noble one through virtue. So one who previously used to kill or steal, they will no longer kill, no longer steal. Just like there was one female lay disciple of the Buddha named Lady Kajutara, her duty was to buy flowers and give those flowers to Queen Samawadi. And so Lady Kajutra would receive a certain amount of money every day to buy flowers. And she would steal uh, 20% of that money. She would take two tenths of it to be her own. And she would buy flowers with the other eight parts of 10 or 80% of that money. But then one day she listened to the Dhamma and the Dhamma entered deeply into her heart. And she realized stream entry then she no longer wanted to steal that 20%, but she used all the money to buy flowers. And that day when she returned to the palace with all those flowers, Queen Samawadi asked, why are there more flowers than usual? She felt this was strange, so she asked why. And Lady Kajutra answered that she had listened to the Dhamma from the Buddha and realized stream entry so hearing this, Queen Samawadi and her retinue, they wanted to listen to the Dhamma as well. And so they prepared a high seat and had Lady Kajutara uh, properly bathe and uh, dress herself, make the body clean first, and then she went to the high seat to teach the Dhamma. And listening to the Dhamma from Lady Kajutara, Queen Samawadi and her retinue attained stream entry as well. So we can see this is the benefit of virtue, leads to seeing the Dhamma. And having seen the Dhamma already, one cares for the virtue uh, completely. So we can have a sense of pride that we have these five precepts or eight precepts already. This can give strength and energy to our minds. We keep it as a solid foundation that leads us to see the Dhamma. So may you all set your hearts on this. May you all grow in Dhamma and grow in blessings.